Hello once again. I hope you guys are having a good day today. Um, we are here once again as we get ready to experience another part of the adventure of the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. So why don't we begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the way in which you always look upon us with mercy. Help us to learn how to be merciful to one another and to be able to always keep our eyes fixed on you, to love you with everything and to love our neighbor as ourself. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So if you remember last time, we we concluded the adventure with Eustace. Remember how he became a dragon and then how he was freed of being a dragon? And they found the second of the seven lords and now there's only five more left that they need to find. Remember we found Lord Byrne and he was at the Lone Islands. He's the one who rescued Caspian. And then we found Lord Octasian who seems to have either been turned into a dragon or maybe was eaten by the dragon. Um, but they found that arm bracelet of Lord Octasian, and so they know that he must have died on that island one way or another. So now they have five more of these seven lords to find. This chapter is called, this is chapter eight, Two Narrow Escapes. Hmm. Sounds adventurous. Everyone was cheerful as the Dawn Treader sailed from Dragon Island. They had fair winds as soon as they were out of the bay and came early next morning to the unknown land, which some of them had seen when flying over the mountains while Eustace was still a dragon. It was a low green island inhabited by nothing but rabbits and a few goats, but from the ruins of stone huts and from blackened places where fires had been, they judged that it had been peopled not long before. There were also some bones and broken weapons. Pirates work, said Caspian. Or dragons, said Edmund. The only other thing that they found here was a little skin boat, a coracle on the sands. It was made of hides stretched over the wicker frame framework. It was a tiny boat, barely four feet long, and the paddle which still lay in it was in proportion. They thought that either it had been made for a child or else that the people of that country had been dwarves. Reepicheep decided to keep it as it was just the right size for him. So it was taken on board. They called that land Burnt Island and sailed away before noon. For some five days they ran, they ran before south southeast wind out of sight of all the lands and seeing neither fish nor gull. Then they had a day that rained hard till the afternoon. Eustace lost two games of chess to Reepicheep and began to get to like his old and disagreeable self again. And Edmund said he wished that they could have gone to America with Susan. Then Lucy looked out of the stern windows and said, hello. I do believe it's stopping. And what's that? They all tumbled up to the poop at this and found that the rain had stopped and that Drinian, who was on watch, was also staring hard at something astern, or rather at several things. They looked a little like smooth, rounded rocks, the whole line of them with intervals about 40 feet in between. But they can't be rocks, said Drinian because they weren't there five minutes ago. And one's just disappeared, said Lucy. Yes, and there's another one coming up, 
said Edmund. And nearer, said Eustace. Hang it, said Caspian. The whole thing is moving this way. And it's moving a great deal quicker than we can sail, sire, said Dranian. It'll be up with us in a minute. They all held their breath, for it is not at all nice to be pursued by an unknown something, either on land or sea. But what it turned out to be was far worse than anyone had suspected. Suddenly, only about the length of the cricket pitch from their port side, an appalling head reared itself out of the sea. It was all greens and vermilions with purple blotches, except where a shellfish, shellfish clung to it and, and shaped rather like a horse's, though without ears. It had enormous eyes, eyes made for staring through the dark depths of the ocean, and a gaping mouth filled with double rows of sharp fish-like teeth. It came up on what they first took to be a huge neck, but as more and more of it emerged, everyone knew that this was not its neck, but its body, and that at last they were seeing what so many people have foolishly wanted to see, the great sea serpent. The folds of its gigantic tail could be seen far away, rising at intervals from the surface, and now its head was towering up higher than the mast. Every man rushed to his weapon, but there was nothing to be done. The monster was out of reach. Shoot, shoot, cried the master bowman, and several obeyed, but the arrows glanced off the sea serpent's hide as if it was iron-plated. Then for a dreadful minute, everyone was still, staring up at its eyes and mouth and wondering where it would pounce. But it didn't pounce. It shot its head forward across the ship on a level with the yard of the mast. Now its head was just behind the, fight, the fighting top. Still it stretched and stretched till its head was over the starboard, the starboard bulwark. Then down it began to come, not onto the crowded deck, but into the water, so that the whole ship was under the arch of the serpent. And almost at once that arch began to get smaller. Indeed, the starboard of the sea serpent was now almost touching the dawn treader's side. Eustace who had really been trying very hard to behave well till the rain in the chest put him back, now did the first brave thing he had ever done. He was wearing a sword that Caspian had lent him. As soon as the serpent's body was near enough on the starboard side, he jumped on to the bulwark and began hacking at it with all his might. It is true that he accomplished nothing beyond breaking Caspian's second best sword into bits, but it was a fine thing for a beginner to have done. Others would have joined him at, at that moment. At that moment, Reepicheep had not. Uh, others would have joined him if, at that moment, Reepicheep had not called out, "Don't fight, push!" It was so unusual for the mouse to advise anyone not to fight that even in that terrible moment, every eye turned to him. And when he jumped up onto the bulwark forward of the snake and set his little furry back against the huge, scaly, slimy back and began pushing as hard as he could. Quite a number of people saw what he meant and rushed to both sides of the ship to do the same. And when a moment later, the sea serpent's head appeared again, this time on the port side, and this time with its back to them, then everyone understood. The brute had made a loop of itself round the dawn treader and was beginning to draw the loop tight. And when it got quite tight, snap. There would be floating matchwood where the sea, where the ship had been, and it could pick them out of the water one by one. Their only chance was to push the loop backward till it slid over the stern, or else, to put the same thing another way, to push the ship forward out of the loop. Reepicheep alone had, of course, no more chance of doing this than of lifting up a cathedral. But he had nearly killed himself with trying before others shoved him aside. Very soon, the whole ship's company, except Lucy and the mouse, which was feigning, was in two long lines along the, along the two bulwarks, each man's chest to the back of the man in front, so that the weight of the whole line was in the last man, pushing for their lives. For a few sickening seconds, which seemed like hours, nothing appeared to happen. Joints cracked, sweat dropped, breath came in grunts and gasps. Then they felt the ship was moving. They saw that the snake loop was further from the mast than it had been. Then they also saw that it was smaller, and now the real danger was at hand. 
Could they get it over the poop? Or was it already too tight? Yes, it would just fit. It was resting on the poop rails. A dozen or more sprang up on the poop. This was far better. The sea serpent's body was so low now that it could make a line across the poop and push side by side. Hope rose high till everyone remembered the high, carved stern, the dragon tail of the dawn treader. It would be quite impossible to get the brute over that. An axe, cried Caspian hoarsely, and still shove. Lucy, who knew where everything was, heard him where, where she was standing on the main deck, staring up at the poop. In a few seconds, she had been low, got the axe, and was rushing up to the ladder to the poop. But just as he reached the top, there came a great crashing noise, like a tree coming down, and the ship rocked and darted forward. For at that very moment, whether because the sea serpent was being pushed too hard, or because it foolishly decided to draw the noose too tight, the whole of the carved stern broke off, and the ship was free. Others were too exhausted to see what Lucy saw. There, a few yards behind them, the loop of the sea serpent's body got rapidly smaller and disappeared into a splash. Lucy always said, but of course she was very excited at the moment, and it may have only been imagination, that she saw a look of idiotic satisfaction on the creature's face. What is certain that it was a very stupid animal. For instead of pursuing the ship, it turned its head round and began nosing all along its own body as if it expected to find the wreckage of the Dawn Treader there. But the Dawn Treader was already well away, running before a fresh breeze, and men lay and sat panting and groaning all about the deck, till presently they were able to talk about it and then to laugh about it. And when some rum had been served out, they even raised a cheer and everyone praised the valor of Eustace, though it hadn't done any good, and of Ripachi. After this, they sailed for three days more and saw nothing but sea and sky. On the fourth day, the wind changed the north, and the seas began to rise. By the afternoon, it had nearly become a gale, but at the same time, they sighted land on their port bow. By your leave, sire, said Drinian, we will try to get under the lee of that country by rowing in Lion Harbor, maybe till this is over. Caspian agreed, but a long row against the gale did not bring them to the land before evening. By the last night of that day, they steered into a natural harbor and anchored, but no one went ashore that night. In the morning, they found themselves in the green bay of a rugged, lonely-looking country, which sloped up to a rocky summit. From the windy north, Beyond that summit, clouds came streaming rapidly. They lowered the boat and loaded her with any of the water casks which were now empty. Which stream shall we water at, Drinian? said Caspian, as he took his seat in the stern sheets of the boat. There seemed to be two coming down into the bay. It makes little odd, sire, said Drinian, but I think it's a shorter pull to that on the starboard, the eastern one. Here comes the rain said Lucy. I should think it does, said Edmund, for it was already pelting hard. I say, let's go to the other stream. There are trees there, and we'll have some shelter. Yes, let's, said Eustace. No point in getting wetter than we need. But all the time, Drinian was steadily steering to the starboard, like tiresome people in cars who continue at 40 miles an hour when you are explaining to them that they are on the wrong road. They're right, Drinian, said Caspian. Why don't you bring her head round and make for the western stream? As your majesty pleases, said Drinian a little shortly. He had had an anxious day with the weather yesterday, and he didn't like advice from landsmen. But he altered course, and it turned out afterwards that it was a good thing he did. By the time they had finished watering, the rain was over, and Caspian, with Eustace, the Pavenses, and Ripachi, decided to walk up to the top of the hill and see what could be seen. It was a stiffish climb through coarse grass and heather, and they saw neither man nor beast except seagulls. When they reached the top, they saw that it was a very small island, not more than 20 acres, and from this height, the sea looked larger and more desolate than it did from the deck, or even the fighting top, 
of the Dawn Treader. Crazy, you know, said Eustace to Lucy in a low voice, looking at the eastern horizon, sailing on and on in, in that with no idea what we may get to. But he only said it out of habit, not really nastily, as he would have done it at one time. It was too cold to stay long on the ridge, for the wind was still blowing freshly from the north. Don't let's go back the same way, said Lucy as they turned. Let's go along a bit and come down by the other stream, the one Trinian wanted to go to. Everyone agreed to this, and after about 15 minutes, they were at the source of the second river. It was a more interesting place than they had expected. A deep little mountain lake, surrounded by cliffs, except for a narrow channel on the seaward side out of which the water flowed. Here at last they were out of the wind and all sat down on, in the heather above the cliff for a rest. All sat down, but one, it was Edmund, jumped up again very quickly. They go in for sharp stones on this island, he said, groping about in the heather. Where is the wretched thing? Ah, I've got it now. Hello. It wasn't a stone at all that I was sitting on. It's a sword hilt. No, by Jove, it's the whole sword. What, what the rust has left of it. It must have been lain here for ages. Narnian too, by the look of it, said Caspian, as they all crowded round. I'm sitting on something too, said Lucy, something hard. He turned, it turned out to be the remains of a mail shirt. By this time, everyone was on hands and knees, feeling in the thick heather in every direction. Their search was revealed, one by one, a helmet, a dagger, and a few coins. Not Kalorman crescents, but genuine Narnian lions and trees, as you might have seen any day in the marketplace in Beaver's Dam in Ber or Baruna. It looks as if this might be all that's left of one of our seven lords, said Edmund. Just what I was thinking, said Caspian. I wonder which it was. There's nothing on the dagger to show. And I wonder how he died. And how we are to avenge him, added Reba Cheap. Edmund, the only one in the party who had read several detective stories, had meanwhile been thinking. Oh, look here, he said. There's something very fishy about this. He can't have been killed in a fight. Why not, said Caspian. No bones, said Edmund. An enemy might take the armor and leave the body. But whoever heard of a chap who won a fight carrying away the body and leaving the armor? Perhaps he was killed by a wild animal, Lucy suggested. It'd be a clever animal, said Edmund, that would take a man's mail shirt off. Perhaps a dragon, said Caspian. Nothing doing, said Eustace. A dragon couldn't do that. I ought to know. Well, let's get away from the place anyway, said Lucy. She had not felt like sitting down again since Edmund had raised the question of bones. If you like, said Caspian, getting up, I don't think any of the stuff is worth taking away. They came down and round to the little opening where the stream came out of the lake and stood looking at the deep water within the circle of cliffs. If it had been a hot day, no doubt some would have been tempted to, to bathe and everyone would have had a drink. Even as it was, Eustace was on the very point of stooping down and scooping up some water in his hands when Reepicheep and Lucy both at the same moment cried, Look! So he forgot about his drink and looked into the water. The bottom of the pool was made of large grayish blue stones and the water was perfectly clear. And in the bottom lay a life-size figure of a man, made apparently of gold. It lay face downward, with its arms stretched out above its head. And it so happened that as they looked at it, the clouds parted and the sun shone out. The golden shape was lit up from end to end. Lucy thought it was the most beautiful statue she had ever seen. Well, said Caspian, that was worth coming to see. I wonder, can we get it out? I can die for it, sire, said Reepicheep. No good at all, said Edmund. At least, if it's really gold, solid gold, it'll be far too heavy to bring up. 
and that pool's 12 or 15 feet deep if it's an inch. Half a moment, though. It's a good thing I've brought a hunting spear with me. Let's see what the depth is like. Hold on to my hand, Caspian, while I lean out over the water a bit. Caspian took his hand and took his hand, and Edmund, leaning forward, began to lower his spear into the water. Before it was halfway in, Lucy said, I don't believe the statue is gold at all. It's only the light. Your spear looks just the same color. What's wrong? asked several voices at once. For Edmund had suddenly let go of the spear. I, I couldn't hold on to it, gasped Edmund. It seemed so heavy. And there it is on the bottom now, said Caspian. And Lucy is right. It looks just the same color as the statue. But Edmund, who appeared to be having some trouble with his boots, at least he was bending down and looking at them, straightened himself all at once and shouted out in a sharp voice, which people har hardly ever disobey. Get back, back from the water, all of you, at once. They all did and stared at him. Look, said Edmund, look at the toes of my boots. They look a little bit yellow, began Eustace. They're gold, solid gold, interrupted Edmund. Look at them, feel them. The leather is pulled away from it already, and they're as heavy as lead. By Aslan, said Caspian. You don't mean to say... Yes, I do, said Edmund. The water turns things into gold. It turned the spear into gold. That's why it got so heavy. And I was just lapping, and it was just lapping against my feet. It's a good thing I wasn't barefoot. And it turned the toe caps into gold. And that poor fellow on the bottom, well, you see. So it isn't a statue at all, said Lucy in a low voice. No. The whole thing is plain now. He was here on a hot day. He undressed on top of the cliff where we were sitting. The clothes have rotted away or been taken by birds to line nest with. The armor is still there. Then he dived and don't, said Lucy. What a horrible thing. And what a narrow shave we've had, said Edmund. Narrow indeed, said Ripachi. Anyone's finger, anyone's foot, anyone's whisker, anyone's tail might have slipped into the water at any moment. All the same, said Caspian, we may as well test it. He stooped down and wrenched up a spray of heather. Then, very cautiously, he knelt beside the pool and dipped it in. It was the heather, it was heather that he dipped. What he drew out was a perfect model of heather made of the purest gold heavy and soft as lead. The king who owns this island, said Caspian slowly, and his face flushed as he spoke, would soon be the riches of all, the richest of all kings of the world. I claim this land forever as a Narnian possession. It shall be called Goldwater Island, and I bind all of you to secrecy. No one must know of this, not even Drinian, on pain of death. Do you hear? Who are you talking to, said Edmund? I'm no subject of yours. If anything, it's the other way around. I am one of the four ancient sovereigns of Narnia, and you are under allegiance to the high king, my brother. So it has come to that, King, Het king Edmund, has it? And Caspian laying his hand on his sword hilt. Oh, stop it, both of you, said Lucy. That's the worst thing of doing, that's the worst of doing anything with boys. You're all such swaggering, bullying idiots. Her voice died away in a gasp, and everyone else saw what she had seen. Across the gray hill side above them, gray for the heather was not yet in bloom without noise, without looking at them, and shining as if he were in bright sunlight, though the sun had in fact gone in, passed with slow pace the hugest lion that human eyes have ever seen. 
In describing the scene, Lucy said afterwards, he was the size of an elephant. Though at another time, she only said, the size of a cart horse. But it was not the size that mattered. Nobody dared to ask what it was. They knew it was Aslan. And nobody ever saw how or where he went. They looked at one another like people waking from sleep. What were we talking about? said Caspian. Have I been making rather a fool of myself? Sire, said Reepicheep, this is a place with a curse on it. Let us get back on board at once. And if I might have the honor of naming this island, I should call it Death Water. That strikes me as a very good name, Reep, said Caspian. Though now that I come to think of it, I, I don't know why. But the weather seems to be settling, and I dare say Drinian would like to be off. What a lot we shall have to tell him. But in fact, they had not much to tell, for the memory of the last hour had all become confused. Their majesties all seemed a bit bewitched when they came aboard, said Drinian to Rince some hours later, when the Dawn Treader was once more under sail and Deathwater Island already below the horizon. Something happened to them in that place. The only thing I could get clear was that they think they found the body of one of these lords we're looking for. You don't say, Captain, answered Rince. Well, that's three. Only four more. At this rate, we might be home soon after the new year. And a good thing's too. My backy's running a little bit low. Good night, sir. And that is the end of this chapter. The next chapter will be called The Island of the Voices. So they had two adventures in this chapter. They were dealing with a huge sea serpent. But then they also went to this mysterious island. Do you see how a water that can make anything gold, you could become the richest, but do you see how it started to possess them? It started to make them do things that were not good. And they started fighting over having that power of of wealth there. And that's a, that actually, there's a, there's an old story called King Midas and the Golden Touch. And in many ways, it's very similar to this. There was this king who wished that he could be able to touch anything and it would turn to gold. But sometimes be careful what you ask for because anytime he tried to eat something, he couldn't eat it because it turned into gold. Anytime he tried to drink something, it turned to gold. Anytime he tried to sleep on his bed, he couldn't because it turned into gold. And even someone that he dearly loved, he tried to touch them and they turned to gold. So it's a, it's a reminder. And ultimately in that story, he's able to, to not want that wish anymore and things are able to be healed. But uh, it's always important to be careful what you wish for because sometimes God knows what we need and maybe what we're asking for is ultimately something that might not be good for us. So it's always important to trust that God knows what we need even more than we do. Let's close with prayer. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And may the Lord bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a wonderful day. God bless you. See you tomorrow.